Hello everyone and welcome back to the Brightworks and another match of Beyond All Reason. Today we're taking a look at a map called Pinch Point and it definitely plays the same notes in my mind, at least as uh, Failed Negotiations, another map that features prominent sea lanes as well as an air start in the back, a dedicated air start, a whole lot of good fun like that. There's also some cool mountain ranges with geothermal spots and stuff like that. Gives the air player a little bit more authority over different parts of the map, sending transports out, trying to capture those areas. I think it's one of the best. So spawning today in the back line of the blue team is an Armada commander goes by the name of Trash Panda. Trash Panda coming in at 44 true skill and a gold star in the chevrons to count. I believe that gold star indicates that they've won a tournament. I believe once you win a tournament, you can have that star put on your name. I think that's what that means anyway. Feel free to correct me if you know exactly what it means down below in the comment section. Spawning, uh, well, in essentially the opposite position right here, right on the front line, goes by the name of Jezza. Jezza going to be clocking in at 35 true skill here, as well as a silver tail of Chevron's gonna be representing quite a lot of experience for the red team here. Spawning on the front line definitely puts you in a tricky position. You have all this area to fight for up on the front lines over here, but it also means you have a lot of area to worry about. So we'll, uh, well, I'll be interested to see what the red commander can manage to pull off here. It'll be tricky, but going up against uh, Fat Cop, Maybe not the uh, most, you know, indicative name, but <laughs> the uh, green commander nonetheless here. Definitely showing with a little bit less true scale value. Now the true scale value, it can be deceptive. Oftentimes the uh, true scale value, once you get above, uh, I want to say maybe 20, 25, up to those 30s, it really stops becoming exactly a measure of exactly how good you are and more so just how, how long you've played the game. I definitely think a blend of the open skill value as well as the the uh, chevron value over on the left gives you a better readout. Resbot's already eating up things in the middle of the map. We also have a rascal coming across the map here from Captain Nesmith, the Cyan Canadian player here. I'm going to be trying to get a little bit of damage done. This rascal will go into the back line and it will find, at the very least, the red base over here. If we switch into Captain Nesmith's uh, perspective here, force perspective here, I just realized we have a different different mascot here. Okay, there we go. We do finally scout the base. We also scout the transport. Oh, we scout the transport. Wait a second. Fighters? Any fighters? Ah, Lavender Fighter is a little too slow here. Not going to be able to capture that transport. We'll catch that transport mid-flight right here. And Jezza will manage to claim this 5.2 metal per second. Metal extractor. Very, very nicely done. Now, unfortunately for the red commander, Leaving with the commander has left the base a little bit vulnerable here and suddenly this rascal with two kills to its name Manages to bring down a couple of those metal extractors here for the red commander who is Finally gonna get a grunt out to address all this just a little too late. We do have the resbot though So at the very least we could see that uh, re we could see that resurrected But this is gonna be huge the red commander Jezza essentially donated a tremendous amount of metal right here as the cyan commander sends forward the, uh, well, commander itself directly into the prying hands of the red player's armada team leader. That's gonna be huge. That's gonna be really, really huge. I'd love to see that play right there. Capturing this island that was a little bit closer to the enemy, the, uh, the metal extractor being closer to the enemy here to establish a presence. Definitely an excellent play, and getting that much metal thrown into the red economy this early on is gonna be quite wonderful. And we do have a constructor that was... I'm guessing transported over to this island. It must The transport must have been shot down by these planes over here, but at the very least, the constructor remains, so for the time being, Shoreshaw is going to have an excellent position uh, using this constructor up in this high ground right here. We can see some build power come up, we can see LLTs come up, all that good stuff. Looks like Nolius, though, not going to be having it, decides to fly the commander on over. No anti-air defenses or anything like that set up quite yet, so the tank commander will have no problem pushing forward right here. I heard another commander go down. Oh, there it is. Was that another one in a transport? Oh, I think that was another commander in a transport right there, shot down by these planes. So important to get those planes up early on this map. That is just beautiful. I thought I heard it in the ocean. I thought it was all the way over here. I guess that's why I was looking. Been missing more and more of those recently. I think my brain is scrambled after hosting that uh, live stream. So much bar all day long. Definitely tires the neural pathways. Pounder is pretty good, though. Definitely pretty good, especially against these T1 grunts. Fighters still patrolling around in the back line here, looking to catch any commanders that are lurking around. Jordan trying to push forward right here. 
A little bit of a tricky scenario because the yellow commander can't really get back out into the water, otherwise this torpedo launcher as well as that frigate are gonna blast away. Yeah, kind of a kind of a tricky spot to be in right here. For our yellow commander. K Corp has got to be pretty glad about this. Got the 5.2 well locked down and also has a whole bunch of LLTs here. Definitely more than enough to stop that yellow commander from pushing any further forward. And yeah, constructor forced to flee for its life. And that submarine chasing after all the mechs is over there. Oh, a little bit of a commander drop over here. This is a ballsy play, but I think it's well worth it. The red commander already ate up a commander's worth of metal. So even if we lose this commander, it just means that things are equalized. LLT comes up and running. We need to degun that down immediately. But then I think this is completely free. LLT does go down, and that's the Red Commander making a huge play across the map here, cleaning up the entire facility right now that belongs to Captain Nesmith. This is a ton of damage coming across right here from the Red Leader. We have a T2 lab coming up in the back line for the Blue Team Leader. Meanwhile, the Red Team Leader showing us exactly how much damage can be done with that very first unit that drops onto the field from its orbital drop pod. The Commander absolutely obliterating these forces over here. Now, the transport was shut down, so unfortunately... Just not going to be able to move anywhere else. It'd be cool to see the transport moved up to this high ground right here. I really feel like that would be effective. Put your put your commander up here and then lock this high ground down and then start barraging the sides with artillery pieces or maybe even just building gauntlets or rattlesnakes, any of those T2 long range artillery pieces. But already this is a devastating amount of damage right here for the red team. Early aggression versus early eco. And once that T2 kicks in here, and it will kick in eventually for Trash Panda, it will be a massive economic advantage. However, it's not like we can't do the same thing with all that metal that we're reclaiming on this front line here. Jezza trying desperately to escape with this commander. McDuddle pulled the commander to try and deal with this and will manage to clear, well, chew away the commander in red right now. But at the very least, this has absolutely crippled the Cyan commander. We do have a single constructor as well as a single construction turret. Not ideal. Certainly not ideal. Very difficult to rebuild in this sort of a situation. You have to rely very heavily on your teammates, and if they don't have your back 100% of the way, things can be quite dire. Yeah, you know what? I wouldn't mind a T2. I wouldn't mind a T2 transition right away from the Red Commander here. Frigates applying a little bit of pressure. You got to be so careful with those. Frigates absolutely should be firing. Oh, no, sorry. Those are allied frigates. <laughs> Those are brown frigates going to be supporting Jezza, actually. The teamwork right here from the red team is just looking phenomenal. The front line is nice and concentrated. You can see these aggravators being microed all the while that we're continuing to uh, push forward with the commander and do all these shenanigans. Commander stepping out into the water to try and clear away whatever we can, and those frigates also contributing quite a lot of firepower here. Now at this point, I wouldn't even mind seeing these aggravators handed over to one of these commanders that has a little more APM to spare, just so we can micro the commander perfectly. But I'm sure with somebody of Jezza's skill level, probably not a problem whatsoever to just keep these stepping forward on a fight command and slowly but surely expressing a wonderful advantage right here. Bottom side, not looking so good for the red team, but really all they have to do is hold because this northern side is crippled and you can see we're eventually going to get these metal extractors back up and running for Captain Nesmith. Uh, Nesmith, sorry, not Nespath. I was thinking it was Nespath for some reason. Reminds me of Nesquick, but uh, probably not exactly what that's supposed to mean. Commander in green goes down right here. Continued aggression, and aggression wins games. The blue team definitely learning exactly the meaning behind that phrase. Yeah, maces are pulled here, but they're so slow, and against this many aggravators, really the only effective counter is about this many aggravators. <laughs> you need just about as many aggravators as your opponent has in order to counter them. There is a weird phenomenon, I talked about this on the live stream, but the uh, the phenomenon with aggravators or rocketeers, any of the rocket bots, nice bombing run by the way, uh, is that they are easier to micro in lower numbers and so can be micro tremendously efficiently. However, you can also kill much more efficiently when they're in larger numbers, right? So if you have more of them, then you don't need to micro them so much for them to be effective. However, if you have lower numbers, the micro potential skyrockets, which is a weird kind of a trade-off, but it is one to be aware of. It means that you're not out of the game if you have an inferior number of rocket bots. You just have to be careful about how you micro them. You have to spend more APM in order to get the same effectiveness, uh, unlike your opponent, who has to spend much less. There we go. Forward vehicle bay goes down right here. This push is looking devastating. The problem here being, of course, that that D-gun wiped out the entire base over here. So despite the Cyan Commander rebuilding right now, it was still several hundred, if not a couple thousand. Well, not a couple, probably about a thousand, three hundred metal or so that was completely wiped out when the base was D-gunned down over here. 
all that metal is gone. It's not reclaimable, it's not resurrectable. It's all gone to the ether, to the void, to the null space. And that means that it set the blue team back quite tremendously here. You can see part of this, the metal advantage, but also the energy advantage is significant right here for the red team. That energy advantage, almost a direct representation of how much metal was sent back to build those high quality energy producers. We are resurrecting over here on the high seas, by the way, for K-Corp. Slowly but surely trying to rebuild the naval force from the wreckage field up here. Jordan also rebuilding the ships while you are using the commander, rather, to rebuild the ships over there. Always tricky, but when you can manage to figure it out, it definitely works pretty well. I would absolutely recommend you go to the replays tab of the Beyond All Reason website. Filter by players and search up Vinaja if you're looking for some great replays on how to play Navy. One of the best pirates on the high seas that I've ever seen. Aggravators facing the medium tanks here. It's one of those matchups that technically looks great on paper, but in practice, medium tanks tend to be just fast enough. It does matter what terrain you're fighting on, but technically, or most, most practically speaking, the medium tanks are usually too fast and the aggravators end up losing to them. The hounds are finally out and running. This is that T2 advantage that eventually is going to come up right here. But this T2 advantage, I mean, we paid for it in the blood of multiple different teammates right here. Whereas the red team is going to be able to tech transition off of the blood of their opponents. <laughs> One of those, obviously, a much better trade for any of these any of these players right here. Losing your teammates in order to get a slightly higher quality army versus uh, killing your opponents to gain a higher quality army. The red team definitely feeling like they're in a great position right here. The blue team on the back foot and going to need some tremendous plays in order to come back to this one. Shershal is trying to keep it together right here. The commander forced to dive into the water right now as there's no way to escape these medium tanks and the grunts marching forward. I think that's a fair play right there, trying to save the commander. You do need the commander to stick around to degun down medium tanks since you know that your opponent's going to be going for him. Full-blown T2 transition set up right here by Juzza, and we are going to see some commando shenanigans. Ah, when this replay was sent on over in the Discord, link down below in the description, by the way, there was a warning that there may be some commando shenanigans happening this match, so I'll have to keep my eyes on exactly what this bad boy decides to build. The commando, for anybody who's uh, unaware, is a special unit for the Cortex faction. They can build scout planes, they can build transport planes, they can build landmines, and they can build static defense turrets. They're a really strange mix of, stat or of uh, aggressive, sneaky unit. They also have a jammer field around them. Easier to see if I switch to Juz's, posi or Juz's uh, viewpoint here. You can see the little jammer field cloaks whatever the the commando is actually building makes them effective as infiltrator units definitely a unique one as far as units and beyond all reason go it fills a lot of weird roles but it can certainly be used to make some stellar plays now in this case it's definitely a when when ahead get more ahead sort of a situation just like using that advantage to make that expensive unit it is 1200 metal to build a commando so definitely not cheap by any measure but well worth uh well worth being aware of the investment how to utilize it properly. The T2, finally cleaning all this up, but we're essentially pushing back just to regain an equal game here, right? The, the red team has already shut down a lot of the metal extractors for the blue. The blue team is just trying to get back into this. They haven't quite made their metal back. And the commando is flying right on by. I do believe it was scouted right there. Yeah, there's a radar tower, so at the very least it's scouted. One of the unique qualities about, jam or about uh, commandos is that they can paratroop. So they fall out of the planes and they're more than capable of getting back up and running. And there they go. This is one of the most common tactics used by these paratroopers is that they can actually put down the landmines right next to enemy buildings, detonate them, and send those buildings plummeting towards their demise. This is lovely. Lovely play right here with the commando. Perfect use case for it where you know it's probably not going to be able to penetrate into the back line because that air wall is thick enough. But you certainly have the option to at the very least, put it in a cheeky position right here. There's not even a geothermal over on this side. Expecting there to be one, but there actually isn't. Always a uh, always a bit of a relief when you see that your opponents don't have the economy that you expected them to. The other annoying thing about the commando, of course, is that it can build that static defense. It can build the Dragon's Maw turret. So if you build it off a cliff or something like that, it can pop up in the back line of your base and be a tremendous pain. Now, viewing the map from a higher perspective here, you can see that the blue line is semi-caved in right here. It kind of follows this trajectory, more or less. 
This metal extractor staying up and running right here, though, is absolutely equalizing the field on the southern side. We do have T2 Mexes coming up as well, and eventually, I think we ought to see a T2 transition right there. But the fact that the blue team is pushed so far off center right here means that that advantage is tremendous for the red team. Commando, ah, there it is. Building itself another transport to get into the back lines. And again, it doesn't need to, uh, yeah, doesn't, doesn't need to worry about actually being dropped out of the plane. It just has to find its way into the enemy back line, and there it goes. No cloaking or anything like that, but only detectable by line of sight. Oh, an amphibious, sure. Why not? A <laughs> little bit more for you, just because, uh, you know, gotta love it. Shuriken were built to try and deal with it, but the commando dove underwater, making it impossible to detect. And now it's gonna go sit in the corner here and wait for an ideal time to strike. Mammoths are coming up from the Red Commander. Okay, that's interesting to see. Mammoths technically counter the Hound just by virtue of being able to actually shoot the same distance as the Hound. It's a bit of a weird mix-up or a weird matchup right there, but it will work slowly but surely. We're going for another commando in the back line here. Interesting. Jezza definitely showing us some cheeky plays today. We're up to a fusion reactor here. In the back line for Trash Panda, we've also got a whole bunch of energy converters coming up. Big old metal storage starting up here as well wonder what the plans are. Are we going to go for T3? It seems like it's about time to go for T3. Maybe try and push out some Marauder early on. Okay, we're going to go second fusion into some more eco. All right. The plan, this this looks like a T2 spam to me because we're just going for the fusion. I think if we were going to go for an Aphis, it would be a more committed T2, uh, sorry, a T3 transition later on. I don't think that's what we're seeing here, though. Commando being very cheeky under the water. Yeah, it'll manage to escape right here. Traveling under the seas. So funny to see those being used as an amphibious unit. A cry for radar mid is sent out across the blue radio channels. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Putting down a radar tower obviously makes these hounds quite a bit better. Allows them to fire out at much larger range. Their line of sight is actually quite poor. Their overall firing range is quite tremendous, though. I'd love to see a rattlesnake up here. I feel like a rattlesnake would certainly lock this down quite a bit better. There's one. Rattlesnake for the Maroon Commander are going to start up over here. Destroyers on the southern side. Shutting down those T2 mexes. That's quite nice. Maybe I called it a little too early about going into a T2 economy. Getting those T2 boats out is tremendous, but also if you can't actually produce any because you're too busy building the T2 lab itself while your metal goes into the lab itself, that certainly can hinder you quite quite tremendously as well. Jordan making a good call probably not to go for that T2 transition in the long run. A couple of butlers idle over here. would love to see those continuing to build their wind turbine fields. One of the superpowers of the butler its ability to build crazy big wind turbine fields pretty quickly. I think it's about 10 seconds for a butler to throw together a wind turbine, assuming no stalls or anything like that. Pretty ridiculous. I guess that would make it six wind turbines a minute. Pretty good wind turbine rate. I couldn't throw together that many wind turbines per minute, that's for sure. Yeah, just like that, Jordan has done a great job of pushing forward this line now. The reason for that being this uh, massive T2 transition here. This could be really, really bad if Jordan doesn't push and capitalize on this right now. If Jordan manages to push forward and shut down the green lab right now, it could absolutely end up winning the naval lane. But it hasn't happened yet. And the longer we wait, the longer we give the green commander time to build more and more of these expensive T2 units. Once that first battleship, for instance, hits the field, very tricky to bring that down using T1. Save for uh, a perfect counter, like for instance, submarines or something like that. Ah, we're gonna build a basilisk. Interesting. I was calling for an, for a uh, long-range plasma cannon, or no, sorry, for a plasma cannon, but Jezza is gonna go even better, one step further, the long-range plasma cannon. Pardon me. Not bad. A little bit rare. I feel like we don't see the LRPCs very often. Ah, uh, Jordan did jump on top of this, by the way. Oh, we gotta take the lab down. Ah, uh, we didn't prioritize the lab. We had to go after the build power, but I think if we take the lab down, it secures it. Not gonna happen, though. Yeah, the forces in yellow just aren't numerous enough. 
That first Buccaneer hits the field, and this is not looking good right now. There's still tons of frigates and even a destroyer available for our Green Commander K-Corp. And I think with that first Buccaneer coming out here, despite the build power ending up falling right here, we do still have a constructor up and available. So rebuilding that build power won't be the end of the world. And eventually I think it'll be a green advantage over the high seas. Mass Marauder coming up right now. We did end up going into the Marauder play. I was expecting something like maybe a, uh, maybe a sharpshooter spam or something like that. But Mass Marauder does make a lot of sense, especially on these naval maps, of course. Uh, but just in general, the Marauder, extremely, extremely powerful. One of those really easy ways to end a mid-game turn. Whoa, pardon me. To uh, turn a mid-game into a late game. Capable of swimming under the water and then popping up wherever they're needed most. Big old bomber and fighter ball. Moving across the map here, trying to find an opening. Where are we targeting him? Uh, we're going right into the blue facility. All right, not bad. I would like to see these drop their bombs right here on this little uh, little base for Shore Shawl, and then continue their bombing run. Is this enough? Not nearly. Heavy impulse bombs might be a little better though. There's a big bo big Marauder ball. It is spotted. The bombers go in. They target the fusion. Ooh, is it enough? It will be enough. That's a massive play right there. The bombers do manage to take down. Uh, essentially the entire production field right there. Yeah, we got all the energy converters. That is the entire production field right there for the blue commander. Absolutely massive play right there. Killer bombing run coming out right now from Zombine. Gets those bombers directly into the back line. And, of course, on top of all that, scouts the mass marauder push that is going to be headed the red player's direction. Scouting that marauder push is one of the easiest ways to counter the marauder push, knowing that it's coming because it means you can get things like, for instance, EMP bombers. Now these have been changed recently, it's worth noting. They've had their AOE per bomb increase, but they de they deploy less bombs per uh, run. So they, de they deploy three bombs and they're essentially nerfed. It was, I think it was overall a nerf. They increased the energy price quite substantially uh, and they made, them, they made them a little bit more expensive to field. LRPC firing away over here. Lovely stuff. Gonna try and blow down the base right here for Shore Shawl. Very tricky, because building, uh, building a plasma deflector is quite an expensive task. I think it's nearly 3,000 metal, I want to say, to build one of those. It's very expensive. Hold on, we can look at that. Yeah, 3,200 metal to build one of those plasma deflector shields. Uh, the commando's being used as landmine layers. Ah, interesting. That's a cheeky little play there as well. Using those to coat the enemy's shorelines and landmines so that the Marauder have a bad day. Luckily for the blue commander, or maybe via good scouting, Going to send the Marauder in a path that doesn't involve a whole bunch of landmines, or try to at the very least, although this commando, if it has anything to say about it, will try and landmine this area. It's a race against the clock. We need to get the landmines up and running before the Marauder hit land. Well, we're going to get quite a few up. Commandos definitely throw them together pretty quick. Nice. Well, they did a duty. They did their job. <laughs> Not enough to shut down the entire Marauder push, but definitely enough to cripple at least one of them. Any amount of efficient damage like that you can do, you might as well take. Also have some... Uh, Scorpions trying desperately to fend off this attack here. A couple of flamethrower turrets, likewise, trying to blast down these Marauder. Those T1 defense is not nearly as compelling, though, and indeed those Marauder do split off from the pack to find all these vulnerable wind turbines. And four of those Marauders ravage the base right here from Nullius. Love to see the Trash Panda isn't out of this game yet, despite being bombed back to the Stone Age. There's those EMP bomber. Oh my goodness, those really don't do much EMP at all. Yeah, EMP bombers significantly nerfed. I was waiting to see them connect with the Marauder and see how effective they were. Nice Deacons right there from Spooky Scary Skeletons. Sending shivers down the spine of the Blue Commander. Well, maybe not. Wow, yeah, those EMP bombers really, really don't do it these days. Oh yeah, those are, those are pretty abysmal, actually. <laughs> You're gonna need about six times as many EMP bombers, it looks like. Down goes the Aphis right there for the, uh, the Orange Commander. 16% EMP? Ugh. Yeah, that is pretty bad. 
We do have the EMP rework enabled, so that's part of the reason why these aren't EMPing all the way. They're, they're EMPing as a half measure just because the, uh, the EMP rework is enabled, so the uh, in, in, in rough, rough, uh, rough summation, what the EMP re rework does is it makes it so that the EMP s slows and stuns units. You can see this Marauder is moving extremely slowly and firing extremely slowly. As opposed to just, uh, it, it kind of builds up over time, right? It, it builds up to a complete stun. As opposed to the other version, the regular version, which is where it just uh, essentially shuts it off once it gets to 100, but it's much easier to get it, get a unit to 100% EMP. Different different kind of play style. You have to, you have to think about EMPing a little bit different, but... Overall, the effect is essentially the same once you get into those mass numbers of EMP units. A couple of Roughnecks here to actually do some some uh, damage, helping clean up these Marauder over here. And eventually that attack is well dealt with. Nicely deflected right here by the Red Commander, building those Scorpions in order to keep the base safe. Deflecting most of that attack, but it did come at the cost of our teammate in the back line here, the Orange Commander, who's been given a tremendous amount of Constructors here. That's always a lovely way to get your teammates back into the game, is just by giving a whole bunch of... T1 air constructors. If you're the air player and you have the facilities to do it, I would definitely recommend it. Now, I thought Jordan was going to be knocked out of this game, but it looks like we have a tremendous Navy coming up and online, partially in, in well, probably more than partially in favor, uh, largely because of this tremendous amount of res subs that we have under the sea. Yeah, we uh, have a couple of resed boats, it does look like. Yeah, I'm seeing a couple of despots and buccaneers and all sorts of other stuff. I'm not sure where their halos are, but I don't know how else these boats could have been produced. Or maybe I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm misreading this tremendously somehow. <laughs> we have a Cortex commander holding both Cortex and Armada boats. Not sure exactly what happened there. A little bit of, uh, a little bit of crossbreeding between the Cortex and Armada commanders, but I guess it's fine. Rodder trying to sneak their way through the shoreline here. Not quite deep enough to actually hide the Marauder, so we do see them peeking their heads up. It means that the tr the tri-headed Cerberus cannon mounted atop that despot is going to start firing away. They also have the uh, the little strike drones over here. Do these have a, a title or a name? No, they don't really. Marauder going to be forced along the landmine path. The path of pain. Those T2 walls. Going to throw a wrench into the plans of these Marauders for sure. Roughnecks, though, gonna dissuade those Marauders even from touching red soil. Back into the seas, they dive. Roughnecks actually gonna be able to continue firing because they can't quite dive deep enough. Yeah, a bit of a weird engagement right there. Weird interaction. Meanwhile, the Mammoths on the front line, the pinnacle of defensive defensive units. Demawa. Demauer? Uh, I can never remember the pronunciation. It's the nickname for a StarCraft pro player. I believe it's German for the wall. That's exactly what I think of every time I see those mammoths. Necessity incites invita er, er, invites invitation. Shorshal has been forced to build a plasma projector. Semi-humbling the economy because of the uh, tremendous cost that you have to put into that. I'm not quite sure if this LRPC has gotten its value out. I would love to see it firing away at some of these other places over here around the map. It has so much potential, but it really feels like it isn't quite working out. Meanwhile... The naval engagement is settled. Jordan manages to wipe the face of the green commander. Now moving in for the kill. The gunship's gonna jump on top of this uh, plasma deflector field. And eventually they're wearing it thin, and there we go. We punch through the shielding enough to snipe the commander over here. A beautiful, beautiful play by the maroon commander. The shields won't hold, down go the labs, and all hell has broken loose. Bomber's gonna come across the geothermal up here again. We didn't get it the first time, but we sure as hell will get it this time. Yeah, I don't think the uh, don't think the maroon commander wants to leave this one intact once more. Those gunships are absolutely killing it on the southern side. The mammoth push, assisted by the grunts pushing through the middle of the map, also doing fabulous work here. But I think the blue team realizes this is not looking good. Captain Nesmith calls the resign vote. Bombers connecting with the back line. Trash Panda decides to tap out of the game here, leaving the Blue Army mindless, brainless, and without a commander to guide them. They will stand, and then they will fall. Now, the thing about Marauder is they do have a backpack anti-air missile. It is not much, but when you have about 400 Marauder, it certainly turns into a little bit of a compelling anti-air force. Yeah. 
Not a compelling anti-battleship force, though. These dreadnoughts are going to have a field day, blasting away the blue commanders, and indeed, clutching victory, the red team manages to pull one over the blue player's eyes. What an excellent match back and forth. I really like this map. Let me know your thoughts about it down below. I always enjoy watching naval maps that uh, end up being contested here, and we had a good long fight on both DCs, and I sure love it. I think I'm going to go take a nap for at least six hours here, but I sure hope that you have a great rest of your day, or if you're laying down for bed, I hope you have a good night. Sleep tight, and I will see you in the very next video of Beyond All Reason. Peace out, everybody.